If you're like me, then the first thing that runs through your head when you see the Fornax Light Track 2 is... What the heck is this? And that's because this Star Tracker is so radically different from all the other ones on the market. And I'll be honest, it took me a couple days to really wrap my head around how this thing even works because I'm so used to just a normal Star Tracker or go-to mount. And in this video, my goal is going to be to show you how to actually use the Fornax 2 from start to finish. That way, if you've already bought this Star Tracker or you're thinking about buying it, you'll have a better idea of how to actually use it. To start off, we need to attach our Light Track 2 to a latitude base of some sort. You can either get the Fornax official base, or today I'm just using a William Optics latitude base. Regardless which base you get, they're all going to do the same thing, and that's just to help us get a good polar alignment. In this case, because I am using the William Optics plate, I need some way to attach this onto here. And thankfully, I've got a lot of spare parts laying around the house, so let me show you what I did. All right, so what I did is I grabbed the dovetail plate from a William Optics Red Cat telescope. I took it off the telescope, and I'm going to attach it to the back of the Fornax light track. So this is one thing you can try, but generally we just need a way for this to connect to your base. And if you're not familiar with dovetail plates and your photographer, dovetail is like the Astro version of Arca Swiss, if that makes any sense to you. So what I'm going to do now is take my dovetail plate, line up the screw holes right here, and then screw it in. Once I have my plate secured on here, we can attach it to the base and then move on with our workflow. Okay, that was easy to do. I just used my little multi-tool here with all the different hex keys. I've attached the dovetail plate to the Fornax mount. And now what I can do, I'm actually going to turn this all around for us, is just slide it right in. And I can just slide it right down like so. And now I have a secure connection from the mount to my latitude base. It's that easy. Now that we have the Star Tracker securely attached to the latitude base, I wanted to cover how this thing actually works because it's not very intuitive. And basically what the designers over at Fornax decided was that the traditional gear and motor design where everything's just internally inside the Star Tracker, which is what you'll see on almost every other model out there, they saw that there were some flaws in that design. And so they came up with this idea of a friction lock motor. And you can see here, if I push this little arm out, this is what's going to be moving throughout the duration of your photos and it's ultimately move your camera with the stars. As the arm swings, your camera will move and that allows you to shoot longer exposures without star trails. So this is kind of the difference here. And we'll get into this more in a few minutes, but I just wanted to make sure you're aware that this is how the mount moves, just with this arm here. Another nice design choice here is that there's a little polar scope arm that rotates out from the back. And this is great because sometimes when you're doing your polar alignment, your camera might be in the way, and with the arm, you can have your polar scope at any angle you want, and then you just crouch down and look through here. So that is one nice design of the Light Track 2. So that's what this arm is for. We'll talk about installing the, uh, installing the polar scope here in a minute. The other thing we need to talk about is how to power the device. Like a larger go-to mount, you will need some sort of external battery to keep this thing running all night long, which is why I have my Jackery 240 watt hour battery. You can use a much smaller little portable power brick if you want, but uh, these are really good investments if you're going to be traveling or anything like that. So I would recommend just picking up a similar battery to this, and I'll have links for everything in the video description. But this is what I'll be using to power the uh, Fornax Light Track. And if you were to look on the back of here, you'll see that there's a 12 volt DC output, and that's what we're going to need to connect to our battery. For those of you that are familiar with the ASIR, I'm actually using the same cable that I use for the ASAR. One end is a 12 volt uh, little car plug, if you will, whatever you want to call that. And then we have the, I think it's like 5.5 by 2.1 millimeter. This will plug into the star tracker. The other end is going to plug into our battery. And if you look down here, you'll see that I have a little tripod hammock. So now I can securely have my battery sitting there. And even though this cable isn't very long, it's just long enough to reach the battery. So if you don't have a tripod hammock yet, it is a nice investment. Okay, now that our Star Tracker has power, let's turn it on and make sure our battery's turned on. There we go. Right now we have four different tracking speeds we can choose, side aerial, solar, lunar, and half. 
99% of the time you're going to want to leave it on sidereal, which is the speed of the stars. But if you want to photograph the moon or the sun, obviously you would switch it to those modes. In the middle we have our hemispheres north and south. Obviously just put it to whatever hemisphere you're currently in. And then we have two buttons over here, top and the bottom. If you click and hold, this is what's going to arm the device, if you want to think about it that way. We're going to go until it stops, and now what's going to happen is that over the course of the next 107 minutes roughly, this arm is going to go through its full range like this, and when it reaches the other end, you're officially out of tracking time, which is a major design flaw as far as I'm concerned, because we'll get to this more later, but I've now reached the end of my momentum arm. I can't go any further. So if I'm photographing the Orion Nebula and I get to this part, the mount's going to stop tracking. I'm going to get blurry stars. Therefore, I have to rotate this thing all the way back to the other end. But in the meantime, I'm going to lose my alignment on the nebula. And we'll get to this again later on. But I just want you to be aware that this is how the tracker is supposed to work. And it is not very well thought out as far as I'm concerned, because you are very limited to your total shooting time before you have to come out here and mess with it. Whereas every other go-to mount and star tracker on the market, you just turn it on. There's no external mechanism like this necessarily. It's all internal and it can run all night long without you having to touch it at all. And that does usually work quite a bit better in terms of just ease of use. So hopefully you have a better understanding of how the mount actually works. It's just this big arm swinging from here to here. That is if you're in the Northern hemisphere anyway. Now I'm gonna attach my ball head and then we'll go from there. All right, once you've grabbed your ball head, you can just screw that on right here. And one thing I wanna mention is that if you're gonna be using a large telephoto lens or maybe a smaller telescope, then you don't necessarily wanna go this route because when you have a ball head here, there's no good way to balance out your setup. And the more out of balance things are, the worse the tracker is gonna perform. So what Fornax has done is they've created an optional counterweight kit and declination bracket, which you can purchase. And unfortunately, the last time I checked, that bundle cost at least like $500 just for a bracket and a counterweight, which is kind of absurd. I could spend $500 and get an entire Skyguider Pro plus its own counterweight and declination bracket and everything for less than that. That's one of my biggest problems I have with the Fornax Light Track is that it's really overpriced and something as simple as a declination bracket costs more than most star trackers. The reason I bring this up is because if you're trying to save money, you're going to go with a ball head, but it's not going to be ideal. And this is where you start running in all these different compromises you're going to encounter with this particular tracker. So if you haven't bought this yet, I wanted to bring this to your attention. That way I can hopefully save you some money. And for those of you that already purchased the tracker, at least now you know some things you're in for. Either way, we've got our ball head attached. At this point, we could attach our camera gear and begin shooting, but we have to remember that every time we go out, we have to do a polar alignment. And the way you want to think about this is that this right here, you want to imagine that being pointed up to Polaris. That's kind of your mental note, if you will. So if I were to crouch down behind the star tracker, I want to look and make sure Polaris is centered right up over the top. Speaking of polar alignments, now would be a good idea to pull the little arm out here and then grab our polar scope, which will attach right into this hole. So let me go grab that and we'll move on. I've got my polar scope right here. This is the one that came with this particular unit. And the big difference you're going to notice between all the different polar scopes is when you look through here, all of them are going to have a slightly different reticle. And to be honest, this one in here is my least favorite of all the options out there. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If we look through this polar scope, you're going to see a straight line with the cross at the top, and then what almost looks like the Big Dipper up above it. The way this polar scope works is you need to rotate the whole thing until that straight long line is pointed up to this star, then you're going to use your azimuth and altitude adjustment knobs on your base to position the North Star right about here on the reticle. And out of all the different alignment techniques out there, this is one of the most difficult as far as I'm concerned. So if you're a beginner, you might have a heck of a time doing this. Therefore, what I'd recommend doing is consider getting a polar scope from either Ioptron or Skywatcher. Their reticles are quite a bit different, and you can use an app on your phone to figure out exactly where to position Polaris. And I personally find that method much easier than this one here. So I'm gonna leave this one that came with it all configured. I'll slide it through here, and then I can use this other little washer piece here that has some threads on it to tighten it down. 
and make sure it's real nice and tight before you let go of the polar scope, otherwise it'll fall out and break. My polar scope has been securely installed to the little arm, and as I mentioned before, I can rotate this to whatever angle is comfortable for me. That way I don't necessarily have to crouch down as far, or if I have camera gear attached, I can move it out of the way. And in this case, I'll just look through here. And remember, what I need to do now is loosen this little adapter piece so I could turn the polar scope and angle that big line so it aims up towards that star. And I realize you might be a little bit confused right now, so I'm putting up instructions from Fervent Astronomy, who's a fellow YouTuber, and what he suggests is to position players on this little line first, then rotate the polar scope, that way the line points towards CoCab, and at that point your alignment should be fairly good. And I will have a link to this PDF in the video description below, just in case you want to go through and read it on your own time. Lastly, I would recommend you go and purchase a Skywatcher or a Optron polar scope instead, just because those are quite a bit easier to use, and if you want to learn more about them, I've got plenty of videos here on YouTube which will explain how to use those polar scopes along with some apps on your phone. So let's say you bought this tracker and you got the polar scope with a reticle that's really not very good. You can always buy the Skywatcher Ioptron model and you'll just take off this little adapter piece from your polar scope, attach it to the other one, tighten it down, and now you can install this into the arm here. So as long as you have this adapter piece, it should be able to go on any polar scope, whether that's Skywatcher, Ioptron, or anything else. Just want to make sure we cover that. Regardless of the polar scope you have, I want to give you a really important trick that you can do, and that might really speed up your polar alignment. One of the difficulties we have is that when we look through the polar scope, we're not sure if we're actually seeing Polaris or a random star. So what I like to do is pick up the whole tripod while I'm looking through the polar scope and move the tripod left, right, up, and down while I'm looking through here. Sooner or later, you're going to see a star that's bigger and brighter than anything else, up where Polaris should be. Now that you've identified what Polaris looks like and you have that mental image, you can gently set the tripod back down on the ground and adjust your azimuth and altitude screws on your base to get Polaris where it needs to be on the reticle. Remember your azimuth adjustments, that's gonna make the North Star move left and right inside the polar scope. Your altitude adjustments are gonna make the North Star move up and down inside the polar scope. That's really all this base is intended to do. And I do recommend doing your polar alignment before you attach your camera gear, because that just adds a lot more things that could go wrong. It's much easier to get your alignment done now than attach the camera gear. And if need be, we can always come in and fine tune the adjustment afterwards. But at this point, we've attached our ball head, we've turned on the device if you want to at this point, and we've got our polar alignment dialed in. Remember, we're just trying to get Polaris at the right spot on the reticle using our altitude and azimuth adjustment screws. Okay, we're nearing the end of our workflow. The next step is to attach our camera to our ball head. Or if you have the declination bracket and counterweight kit, you can attach it to that instead. When you're doing this at night, be very careful because there's so many different knobs and screws on here, you might accidentally turn the wrong one and everything could crash to the ground. And I don't want that to happen to you. So whenever you're working at night, take a second to double check you're turning the right screw. And in this case, I'm gonna aim up right around where the Pleiades were the other night, right about there. I've got the Pleiades roughly in line with my camera and lens right now, and the polar scope is kind of in the way. So what I can do is either just take it out completely, or I can move the arm around to the other side here, where I know it's not gonna get in the way, and I can install the polar scope on this side. The amazing reason you would do this is just so you can look through here. Polaris likely got shifted from a perfect alignment, so by double checking it after your camera gear is installed, you can make your adjustments and you know you're good at that point. I'm gonna leave the polar scope out for right now. I just wanted you to be aware that you could leave it installed in the arm there. So I'll drop this and we'll continue on. I know we just covered this, but I wanted to reiterate how important it is to double check your polar alignment after you've attached your camera gear and you've roughly aimed up to the object you wanna photograph. Because even these slight little adjustments here could potentially mess up a perfect polar alignment and there's no sense in using the tracker unless it has a good alignment. All right, at this point, we're ready to find the object in the night sky, center it up in the frame, get those stars nice and sharp, and then figure out what camera settings are gonna work best. But this brings me to my biggest problem with the Fornax Light Track 2. You only have 107 minutes total. Let me explain that. The way this mount works is that it can only go from about here to about there. 
At this point, it's fully in the armed position. Now, over about the next 107 minutes, it's going to go through this motion from there all the way to the far side, and it's going to be following the stars as it does it. But once it hits the end of its range on the far side, it's going to stop tracking. What that means for you is that, let's say you've been photographing the Pleiades for the last 30 minutes or so and you've reached the end, now you have to loosen one of the screws on your ball head so that way the camera doesn't rotate and hold it firmly, and then reset the arm here. And you have to remember to do this every about 107 minutes, so you might want to start your stopwatch, if you will. Once you have it right here, again, you now have about 107 minutes till it reaches the other end. And so we can lock back down the screw on our ball head, and hopefully throughout that process, the Pleiades didn't leave the frame. Because if it did, now you have to go refine the object, recenter it up, and begin taking your next set of photos. And that's just, for me, a fundamental flaw with this tracker. Every other tracker on the market, including all the GoTo mounts and the SkyGuarder Pro and the Star Adventure, their design allows them to run continuously all night long. You don't have to go out here and arm it and do all this stuff and run out of room. And for that reason, they're a lot easier to use. Then again, Fornax is saying that this friction drive, as they call it, is a lot more accurate than the gear drives on every other tracker. So theoretically, the improved tracking accuracy is worth the headache, but we'll see how true that actually is. I just want you to be aware of that's how this tracker is designed to work, and I personally am not a big fan of it, to be honest. But anyway, getting back on track, we've armed the tracker, we moved it all the way to the end here, and because we are pointed north, the way this is gonna work is that the stars are gonna be moving in this direction in the northern hemisphere and that means our camera is not going to move with the stars so you always want to make sure you're arming it on this side if you're in the northern hemisphere all right so the clock is ticking at this point we need to find our object as fast as possible and get it centered up one thing that can really help you is if you have a laser pointer because without the laser pointer you're just going to be kind of blindly aiming up where you think the pleiades are at or something if you have an old-fashioned dslr you might actually be able to see some of the objects through the viewfinder or at least a bright star near it uh, but anyway, you can try and look through the viewfinder, or, like I said, a laser pointer might really speed things up. I just grabbed a laser pointer out of my hard case, and what I can do now is rubber band this around my lens hood. Then when I turn it on, I can instantly see where the camera is aimed up at. And if I correspond that to some bright stars and use some apps on my phone, I can figure out how to find the object a lot faster. If you are going to be giving this method a try, just make sure that the laser pointer is on the same axis as your lens because if this is up at a weird angle or down then it's not going to be very useful it has to be parallel to the direction of your lens and it might take some finagling to get it to stay where you need it to but that's something you want to do obviously with laser pointers they're not legal in some countries if you're near an airport make sure there's no planes flying overhead you can get a lot of trouble for that but for most of us it shouldn't be an issue and again that will really help speed things up once you've found the object you want to photograph it might help to be zoomed all the way out. Because if you think about it, if you have a wide field of view, you can say, oh, there's the Andromeda Galaxy. You can get it kind of centered up, and then you can zoom in. That's another important little tip. But if you have a telescope and you're locked in in like 400 millimeters, that's going to make this a lot more challenging. And unfortunately, there's no easy way to go about it. In that case, you might want to consider upgrading to a go-to mount if you're having a lot of trouble this step. Because with the go-to mount, you just type in what you want to photograph. It finds it for you and it saves you a lot of headaches. In my experience, I can find most objects that I want to photograph in five minutes. Worst case scenario, it could take me 20 or 25 minutes. Just one more problem with this design. I might waste a good fraction of my total imaging time just getting the object centered up and focused. But assuming you've got the object looking nice and good right there in the center of the frame, now we need to figure out our camera settings. To put this as simply as possible, you're going to want to figure out your max shutter speed first, which is going to depend on your tracker, how accurate your polar alignment is, how well balanced your camera gear is, and some other factors. So the way I like to do this, if I'm going to be at 200 millimeters, maybe start off with a 60 second long exposure and take a photo. When that photo completes, it's going to tell me two different things. First, it'll give me an idea of how bright the sky is. And second, I'll be able to see if there's any kind of trailing whatsoever. If I'm noticing star trails at 60 seconds, maybe the tracker's not turned on, or in this case, it could be because my polar alignment got messed up. That would be the first thing I would check is, I'd still probably have my polar scope attached, I'd look through there and adjust my base as needed. 
after you fix your polar alignment, you can go through and take another 60 second photo. I don't know if you caught that, but I just kicked the tripod leg, which means I messed up my alignment. I have to go back and redo it now. So you can see how all these problems are compounding. Meanwhile, we're still on the clock, and this is slowly moving through our 107 minutes that we have available. Let's take another 60 second long photo and see how the stars look. If they're sharp, we know our tracking's running a little bit better. Maybe now we could push it to two minutes. Let's give that a try. Our number one goal at night is to capture as much light as possible. And the best way to do that with your star tracker is just to shoot longer shutter speeds. That's gonna result in less grain in your photos, less visible amp glow, things like that. And on cold nights like this, the sensor shouldn't get as hot as it would in the summer. So you don't necessarily have to worry about that sensor heat as much. And that's why I always say, try and shoot your longest possible shutter speed without star trails. At that point, you can figure out your ISO. For today's example, let's say I can shoot a solid two minutes and my stars look good. If the image is really bright, then I need to lower my ISO accordingly. Or if the image is really dark and I can barely see what's going on, I need to increase my ISO. This is really just gonna depend on any filters you're using and the amount of light pollution you're shooting through. Some rough estimates would be ISO 800 to 3200 for most cameras. That at least gets you in the ballpark. And then you can adjust up or down from there. Your aperture is usually gonna be wide open, f2.8 in this case. And don't forget, while we're talking about the lens, turn off any kind of vibration control as well as any autofocus because both of those can really mess you up when you start your interval. At this point, all of our camera settings are dialed in, our tracker's still running. Now, if you need to, you can attach an external remote or go through your camera's menu, do what you gotta do, and start taking your photos. I normally let it run for one or two photos before I stop everything and just double check that my images are still sharp, the exposure looks good, and there's no problems. And then after the first two or three photos look good, I usually go in the house, warm up, grab a drink, whatever it is, and Regardless of the tracker you're using, you always want to come out every 15 or 20 minutes, especially if the temperature is dropping throughout the night, because as the temperature drops, your lens will actually contract very slightly, and you might have pinpoint sharp stars at 8 p.m., but by 8.30, they could be noticeably blurry. And so I always recommend every 15 or 20 minutes you come out, you stop your interval, and you refocus if need be. So let's assume now everything's running good, our tracker is going to go through the motions, and once it reaches the end, we're gonna to have to remember to come back outside and reset everything. So we're right about there. Let's say our Pleiades is now moved to about the center of the sky. What I would do is loosen one of the screws on my ball head so I have a firm hand on the camera and the ball head's not gonna rotate on its own anymore. You know, I'm the one moving it. Then I'll use the arming key here to rotate the arm all the way back to the starting position. That way I can keep capturing data. Because realistically, if you have 107 minutes total, you know, you're lucky if you'll get 80 or 90 minutes total realistically out of all that time. So we've reset the mount. Now we have to go back into our live view, center up the object again, make sure the focus still looks good, and then start a next series of images. And keep doing that as many times as you need throughout the night. For those of you that are gonna be using a larger telephoto lens and shooting at 400 millimeters or higher, then it wouldn't be a bad idea to consider getting an auto guider. This is something I've covered in a lot of videos here on YouTube, but the Fornax has a little plug that you can attach an auto guider to. Now, unfortunately, because I'm in the Pacific Northwest now, I haven't seen a clear night in over three months, so I haven't been able to test that, but there is that option if you wanna give it a try, if you do have an auto guider. But it does not use an ST4 port. It uses, frankly, I'm not sure, but uh, it's a little bit different than your other trackers, but I wanted you to be aware that there is a way to attach an auto guider to the Fornax mount. All right, now that we've seen how to actually use the Fornax Light Track 2, I thought I'd give you my quick review on it. If you want to read my full review that's posted over on my website, I'll have a link for that in the video description if you want to read more. To be honest, I would not recommend this tracker for most people for two main reasons. The first is the price. This tracker alone is gonna cost you $500 at least. And you're still gonna to have to buy the latitude base, a battery, potentially, maybe a ball head, the polar scope. And if you're gonna be using a big telephoto lens, you're gonna to wanna to get that counterweight and declination bracket that we can balance things and get better tracking accuracy and put less stress on the mount. So if you add up all that stuff, you're looking at over $1,500, if not substantially more, for the basic package, or more accurately, the full package. 
For $1,500, you can pretty much buy the go-to mount that I use, the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro, if you can find one. And the nice thing about a go-to mount is if you're not really planning on going anywhere with your star tracker, the go-to mounts, you can take them outside in your backyard. And with the go-to function, you just type in whatever you want to photograph. It'll find it for you automatically, and you can begin shooting. And if you watch some of my other videos here on YouTube, you'll see exactly how easy that can be. So for the price, you're kind of getting ripped off. Not to mention, if you want to go the cheaper route, you can spend $500 or less and get something like the Skyguider Pro, which will include everything you need for under $500. And that's what I used for years and took some really amazing photos with. The second problem I have with the Fornax 2 is the overall design of this friction plate. As we looked at, you can only go from here to the same distance on the other side. And if you time that out, it's about 107 minutes of total exposure time. And I've been doing this for years and years, and even myself, it might take me 15, 20 minutes to get this thing ready to go after I've armed it. So that just eats into your 107 minutes you have total before you have to recompose your shot. And in your case, if you have a hard time finding the object, figuring out what camera settings you want to use and focusing, you might waste 30 minutes or longer, and now you're down to maybe here, and it can only go a little bit further over. Whereas every other tracker on the market, including the Skyguider Pro, the Star Adventure, or even the GoTo mounts, those are going to run continuously. You don't have to worry about anything, really, uh, although I would recommend going out and checking it. But my point is, there's no hard stops, and it's just much more user-friendly. So for this reason, and the price, I don't recommend the tracker for most people. The other problems I had were that the reticle that came with this particular polar scope was not very intuitive, and I don't think it's very easy to use. I think most people would be better off with the other reticles, which you can go buy another uh, polar scope. is not that big of a deal. Don't forget, you're also going to need a battery to power your tracker, which I've got my Jackery here. But if you bought like the Skyguider Pro or the Star Adventure, those have either an internal battery, which will last all night long and then some, or they could take AA batteries, and that might last you a whole week's worth of shooting, whereas this requires a constant power connection. The final thing I want to mention today is arguably one of the most important. Fornax markets this mount as the most accurate star tracker on the market. And if you look at some of their photos, they're getting ridiculously long exposures without star trails, even without guiding. In my experience, though, I was barely able to get sharp stars at two minutes. And this is a critical point. This tracker is only as accurate as you are. What do I mean by that? Well, if your polar alignment isn't quite perfect, or if you've got a big heavy lens on here that's not balanced, both of those are really going to affect the tracking accuracy. So you might be going out thinking, oh, I'm going to spend this money on this great mount. It's really accurate. But if you're not up to the challenge, it's not going to be any better than a Skyguider Pro, for example. So I don't want you to get unrealistically high expectations on how well the mount's going to perform. It's really down to you and how much you can pull out of this particular tracker. As I said, I've been doing this for years, and even myself on the first night, just because I wasn't used to the polar scope reticle, among some other problems with the design, I couldn't even get sharp stars at two minutes. Whereas if I was using my Skyguider Pro, I could set up an auto guider real quick and I could easily shoot four or five minutes with sharp stars, just because I'm more familiar with the design and with the help of the auto guider. But my point remains that, again, the tracking accuracy is only as accurate as you are with your polar alignment, your balancing, and some other factors. So I hope this video helped you out today. Whether you bought the tracker and you didn't really understand how it worked, I hope it makes a lot more sense now. Or if you've been thinking about buying it, maybe you realize now it might be a little bit more than it needs to be and you can save a lot of money and get another tracker if that's something that sounds appealing to you. But so that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in another video.